welcome. But we can start uh, with an introduction and presentation. Uh, before I start, I would just like to say that you can ask questions in the chat and in the Q&A during the talk. Uh, but let's start with our jingle. So welcome everyone to this fall's first ENI monthly webinar. And I'm so honored to have today with us uh, Dr. Elizabeth Bick. Uh, she's going to talk about, to us about double trouble. So Elizabeth, uh, the floor is yours. Tell us what is the double trouble? <laughs> <laughs> What do you mean by it? And I'm really uh, amazed that you're here with us today. I'll just introduce you. You are Dutch-American microbiologist. You have worked with uh, for 15 years at Stanford University and then later in industry. But you are a, a science integrity volunteer and consultant. And you did amazing job by scanning biomedical literature for images or data that have actually resulted in, in a retraction of a whole lot of papers. So you have an <laughs> eye for seeing uh, problems in, in the images. And you have also uh, received a 2021 John Maddox Prize as well for your work. So thank you for, for being here. Thank you for doing this amazing work. Uh, and yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sonia, for having me here. I love the jingle also. <laughs> that was very nice. All right, let me set up my presentation. All right, you hopefully should see my screen. So yeah, I'll talk about double trouble. So what do I mean with that? I'll talk about image duplications in biomedical papers. And uh, before I, I start my talk, I will uh, give my financial disclosures. So because I did quit my job, I work at Stanford, I worked two years in industry. And at some point I decided to just switch or basically quit my job and, and work on finding image duplications in papers. And, uh, but yeah, how do I make my money currently? Because I'm not employed by a university or by a company. I work for myself. I uh, do some consulting. I get speakers fees to give talks. Um, this talk is for free, if, I'm, <laughs> if I uh, remember this correctly, but I uh, occasionally will get speakers honorarium and um, consulting fees. So I mainly work for universities and scientific publishers to investigate particular cases of um, allegations of misconduct. And I also have a Patreon account, which is sort of a crowdfunding site where people can give donations. So the average donation per person is uh, $6.50 if I, uh, uh, at least in the latest uh, time I checked. So it's small amounts, but together that gives me a basic income. So I don't have to worry too much about income. And I really appreciate that people support my work because there's not a lot of grants that will fund the type of work that I do, which is basically raising concerns about scientific papers. I also have worked for a fraudulent company called Ubiome. And I still have four patents from that time, although the company was raided by the FBI. The founders have been charged uh, with insurance fraud and they have fled from um, their fugitives for the US government. And apparently they're somewhere in Europe, but uh, so, you know, you might run into them at some point. But um, yeah, the company, the patents, I think are not really worth anything. The company is bankrupt and yeah, it, it it's sort of a, you know, I, I, I embrace that I worked for that company, even, you know, it, it was involved in insurance fraud, but I felt that the scientific test that we were developing at least had some merit. And I am still proud of the work I've done there. And none of the employees have been charged. It was the founders who have been found guilty. Uh, but yeah, my, my criticizers uh, usually want to, uh, you know, let you know that I worked at a fraudulent company. So I'll be the first to admit that I did work there indeed. So what do I do? I look at image duplications in scientific papers. And it all started in 2014 as I was scanning a PhD thesis that I suspected had plagiarized text. And it had, 
But as I was flipping through that PhD thesis and the chapters have been published in scientific papers, I found this particular image here, shown here in, in, in blue, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, probably not, but uh, the, the one that I marked here in the below in cyan color in that cyan box that had a little dot in it in the fourth lane. And I sort of remembered that and I flipped through the PhD thesis and I saw the same image twice in another chapter. Uh, one time it was the exact same image, but it was sort of cropped differently and stretched differently. But another time it was even rotated 180 degrees and it was still, but it was representing different experiments. And I found another image marked here with red boxes that was also used twice, again, to represent a different experiment. And so that, that made me very angry because I thought, especially with this rotated image, the image that had been used twice, but rotated, that sort of suggested that this was done deliberately. And it also made me realize that I have some talent for detecting these duplications. It seems perhaps very obvious, but both of these PhD thesis chapters have been published in scientific papers. And so they have passed peer review, but you, you know, by accident, you can sort of compare these things and, and remember these blots. And yeah, I, I recognized that they were the same. And of course, when you submit a paper that is not really part, there's no, at least at that time, there was no good plagiarism detection for images. And so now there are, are some tools being developed, but yeah, it's, it's really hard to recognize them, but I just happened to see them in the same place. So I've reported both of these papers to the, the journal and both of them were retracted um, a couple of, uh, well, it took still some, some time, but at some point they were retracted. And so I, I thought about like, why is this bad? Because I was first working on plagiarism and, you know, obviously plagiarism, I think we can all agree that's not good, but it doesn't necessarily create fake signs. But representing the same photo, using the same photo twice to represent different experiments, that appears to be either falsification or fabrication because one of these experiments did not happen. And so it made me angry because for me, if, if you think about it, for me personally, science is about finding the truth and representing the same image twice is not the truth. It's it's cheating. It's it's misconduct. And yeah, I also thought about like science publications. This is this is also how we communicate with each other. Scientists, we build on each other's work and we use publications to to look for for inspiration for our own research. And, and so researchers never just do, do research by themselves. We always build on the work that other people have done before us. And so every science publication is like bricks in a wall. And I use this metaphor a lot, but I feel if one of those bricks contains fraud or an error, that means that part of the, the other bricks, the other publications that are resting on that work could be tumbling down. And so science, fraud is is everything that science should not be it's not finding the truth and it's it's hurting other people who try to replicate those work and we if, if we are a scientist you might realize how much research is really hard to replicate and some of that there's many reasons that can cause that but science fraud could be one of them and unfortunately science uh, historically has been built on trust. As scientists, we tr we tend to trust each other's work. If we do a peer review, we tend to think this is really what happens. But unfortunately, there is fraud in science, uh, like in any other uh, field you can think of, think of banking, financing. There, There is construction, perhaps. There is fraud everywhere and also in science. And so I feel scientists and editors and and professors have not really thought perhaps too much about science fraud but but yeah it is fraud and it, it's more and more unfortunately also organized and i'll talk about that in the second half of my talk but um yeah thinking about why scientists do fraud i like to say that behind every case of misconduct there is a sad story there's a case where people felt the need to cheat and so um one of the papers that uh, yeah, was retracted is is actually, so I'm showing that here on the left, 
that is one of the papers of the, the image duplication that I first found that I just showed on, on one of the previous slides. So that paper got retracted and I blurred out the names because I, I feel I don't want to make it about the people who do misconduct. I, I will make it about the papers, but there's multiple papers on every, multiple authors on every paper. Who is responsible for doing the misconduct? Who did that image duplication? Now, in biology, usually the first author is the person who did the lab work. The last author is the person overseeing the lab work, so perhaps the professor. But who is responsible for doing the misconduct? And it's easy for a senior author to, to put the blame, it's that person who did it, it wasn't me. And that's often, unfortunately, what you hear. But all authors on a paper are responsible for the, for the content of the paper. And you could actually argue that perhaps, yes, it was the, the first author, maybe a grad student or a postdoc who, who cheated. But the last author's role is to be the mentor, to be uh, the supervisor, to make sure that the integrity of the paper is correct. And unfortunately, there's many situations where um, people, for example, in the US might be working on a visa because they're they're from a different country and they work on a temporary visa to, to do research in a lab in the US. And if you happen to have a professor who's a bully and very demanding, you could have a situation where perhaps the graduate students are being told that unless they give the professor the results that he or she wants, they might be fired. And if you're fired, your visa immediately expires and you have to leave the US, go back to your home country within a couple of weeks. And so under a threat of being fired, you can imagine that people want to please the professor and want to give him or her the results they want. And so science misconduct is complicated. It's not usually just one person uh, you know, deciding to cheat. They're usually in a very compli complex situation where they feel the only way out is to do misconduct. And unfortunately, it's also you know, the rewards are big because if you do misconduct, you have better results. And so you'll, you'll, you know, you can publish. This is the publish or perish mentality that uh, many of us have to deal with. And the consequences for science misconduct, at least in research, seem to be very small. There's a very small chance of being caught. And it seems that a lot of professors who, you know, under whose um, responsibility, there's lots of cases of suspected misconduct, they get away with it because usually they will blame the persons uh, who are the first authors, so the more junior researchers. So it's a very complex situation, but you could also argue well, there can be many problems with a paper and having just one person um, uh, being, uh, 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 sorry, there, there's, there's two things. So Holden Thorpe, the editor-in-chief of Science wrote an editorial about it. And they, uh, you can say, okay, there's a problem with the paper. And then there's the question, who is responsible? And these are two separate questions. Hopefully papers can get retracted without uh, the very lengthy investigations that institutions usually need to do to investigate who is actually uh, responsible for the, for the misconduct. Now, focusing back on figures. So when you think about figures in scientific papers, this is what I look at but I mainly focus on photos. I will look at photos. And uh, if you think about photos in scientific papers, you can, you can see they're, they're like the photos we can see here on the right, photos of cells or gels or blots or even mice or tissues, things like that. There's lots of details. And we can tell that the photos shown on this slide, they're all good. I don't have any suspicions that there's any misconduct on them, um, but we could, perhaps look for duplications. Now photos are, yeah, like I said, have a lot of detail. If you think about other types of figures in scientific papers, such as line graphs so shown here on the left, there is some detail there, but it's very hard to know if these images are based on real experiments. At least with a photo, you can say, oh, there's a photo of a tissue. So they really did some experiments, but photos uh, or images of line graphs uh, plots and spectra and, and ordination plots and uh, bar graphs and things like that, it's actually very easy to cheat in that without leaving traces. I mean, you can type in some numbers in Excel and make a bar graph that looks realistic. Uh, and you would not really be able to catch if there was any Photoshopping or, or overlapping images. But 
photos, at least there's some detail there. So that is what I focus on. Now, there can be many things wrong with photos that are actually not detectable. And as an example, I think we're very used in this society of looking at images that are heavily manipulated. Um, just as an example, this is a, a cover of a magazine and on this is Faith Hill. Uh, she's a country singer. And on the left is the actual photo that was taken of her. And on the right is how she ended up on the cover of the magazine. And um, just pay attention, for example, on how thick her arm is. Uh, you can see it's like, you know, reduced to a very skinny arm. And I mean, this person is already, you know, perfect to look at. But yeah, somehow these photos get so much airbrushed and, you know, body parts are made slimmer and, uh, you know, apparently what we think is more beautiful. But you you can see how much we're used to being, you know, having looking at photos that are manipulated. And so a lot of people have filters, uh, Instagram filters and things like that. And so it's very tempting to also manipulate your photos, but it's very hard to detect. Like I would not be able to look at this right photo and know that it's manipulated because it doesn't leave any traces. But in several cases, there are traces to be found of uh, duplication. So I cannot really detect a manipulation but I can detect a duplication. So um, here are three types of, um, of duplications that you could find in scientific papers. So starting from the left and moving to the right, there's three categories. And category one on the left is a simple duplication where two images are exactly the same, but being used to represent two different experiments. So the ones boxed with red boxes are duplicates of each other, and the panels uh, marked with blue boxes are also duplicates of each other. And so this could be an honest error. People make, maybe the researcher made thousands of photos and just happened to pick the wrong one. That could happen. It's sloppy, obviously. Uh, and if it's a lot of sloppiness, maybe it is misconduct. But in many cases, these simple duplications, the exact same photo being used twice, could be the result of an honest error. It's inappropriate though, it's an inappropriate image duplication. And the example on the middle shows an example of a repositioned image duplication. Here there are four photos of cells being treated with four different amounts of radiation. So each photo should be different, but the two panels at the top are overlapping and I mark the overlapping areas in green boxes. And the two panels on the right also overlap with each other marked with blue boxes. So Instead of looking at four photos, at best, yeah, there are four photos, but they appear to be only of two specimens. I cannot find an overlap with the fourth image, but maybe there is one. Um, but yeah, is this is this an honest error? Is this done deliberately? Um, you know, we can have a long discussion about that. It's hard to tell. I think it's deliberate, but who knows? And then the example on the right is a is an example where photos have been manipulated to contain now duplicated elements within the photo. So the photo itself has been digitally altered. So you can see four blots, A through D. And in blot A, you can see that lane one and lane three look identical. I've marked those with blue boxes. And in lane, uh, in blot D, three lanes are identical, marked with red boxes. That is very likely to have been done deliberately with an intention to mislead. And so these three types of duplications are helpful in determining whether or not something was done um, yeah, with the intention to mislead. Now here's an example of an inappropriate image duplication of a type one. And let me, my cursor is not moving. That's my cursor, yes. Oh, there we go. So here's an example of a type one duplication where you can see seven different panels. You can test now your ability to spot these. Uh, and I hope you haven't seen, I tried to rotate through my examples, but here's an um, example where you can see seven different photos. You can see that they have seven different labels. So they should represent seven different experiments, but two of these photos are identical, even though they have different labels. And uh, this was a paper published uh, from a group in Canada. Um, and I reported it to the journal in October 2015. And unfortunately, this has not been addressed yet. And let me show you, maybe you have spotted the duplication yourself of some 
Sonia says NS and E2, and she is right. That is correct. This is a very easy one. I hope you can all see that, that these photos are the same. Now, yay, yes. <laughs> well done, well done. You you get an emoji award if you, if you would play this uh, game with me. I play this game also on Twitter and on Blue Sky, called, and I call it hashtag image forensic. So you can win an emoji award. And um, usually the examples are a little bit harder, though. But um, this one was fairly easy to spot. I do want to say again, want to stress that this is very likely an honest error. Uh, I don't suspect any intention of fraud here. It's inappropriate and it's worth raising. But unfortunately, neither the journal nor the authors uh, replied. I also posted this on Papier. I'll talk about that later also. But uh, yeah, nothing happened. And of course, this is not the end of the world. This, you know, that they took the wrong photo. But, you know, it's an error and it should have been corrected. This one is a little bit harder. So here's an example of a type two duplication. We're looking at a time series of cells being treated by something. And uh, you know all of these photos should be slightly different, although you could argue that cells over time perhaps um, you know, could look similar because maybe they're like floating around in the medium and so, but you would not expect these photos, even it's in a time series to look exactly the same or to show overlaps. So in this case, we're looking at overlapping repositioned images, and there are several of them. And uh, this paper actually got retracted, so you can perhaps already suspect that there's something bad going on here. And uh, there is. So I'll I'll show you the example of the the duplications here, and you can see there's a, so I've marked them here with with um, colored boxes. So boxes of the same color show the exact same uh, overlapping region. And you can see it's not just an overlap or shift under the microscope, it's also a rotation. For example, um, yeah, the two marked in green, the two hour and eight hour in the top, they overlap, but there's a there's a rotation. So, um, or a mirroring, I think. Yeah, a mirroring. And so there's all kinds of repositioning going on here. There's different zoom factors. And so this seems very likely to have been done with the intention to mislead. And the, the editors agreed with that. So moving on to a type three duplication. So now we're looking at one photo with duplicated elements. And this one, I don't know, once you see it, you're like, oh, whoa. Well, but um, maybe you can see it. This one is pretty hard to see. Uh, this is a, a trans, I think a transmission electron microscopy photo of some, I don't know, nanoparticles or tissue. It doesn't really matter what it is, but there's duplicated elements here that once you see them, um, or maybe you don't see them, but let, let's see let's see if we can find the answer. And there it is. There's lots of duplicated elements here with, you know, within the photo, parts of this photo appear to have been duplicated and uh, rotated even. And, and so this is uh, very unlikely to have happened by accident. So this seems very likely to have been done intentionally. This was uh, the duplications on the right part of the photo were first um, found by Alexander Magazinov. So I want to give him credit, but uh, I found all the others. Um, and I'm using actually, you know, I see I see these things by eye. I also use software to find it called Image Twin. So it will find some of these duplications. But some of them you just are not found by software. You just have to see them, especially when it's rotated a little bit. These things are very hard to detect by software. But yeah, a lot of duplications going on, uh, very likely to have been done intentionally. I cannot think of any technical explanation. And uh, here's a very extreme example. These are Western blots. Lots of duplicated elements here. Bands appear to have been duplicated. Backgrounds have been duplicated. Things have been spliced and moved around. And you have to wonder why, but I, I'm not quite sure why, but um, this was, um, uh, I only reported this online so far, but no response from the authors. And yeah, I would, if I was an author, I wouldn't really know what to say either. But uh, yeah, how how did, did this happen by accident? I cannot think of any reason. But yeah, who knows? Maybe the author has a good explanation for this. Uh, but we're still waiting for one. And so sometimes you can find these duplications in plots. So this is actually an example that is not a photo. Occasionally, you will find these duplications in plots. So here you have a plot of an NMR spectrum with peaks and noise, and the noise appears to have been duplicated, perhaps in an attempt to remove some of the peaks. So perhaps the 
chemical compound wasn't as clean as the authors wanted us to believe. And this paper got retracted from uh, scientific reports. And so I've done a lot of this screening on um, biomedical papers. And in 2016, I published this paper together with Arturo Casadeval and Farrick Feng. And uh, what we did is uh, I screened 20,000 paper by eye. At that time, there was no software yet. So I scanned all these papers spanning 20 different years, 40 different journals, and 14 different publishers. I scanned them by eye for duplications within the paper. And I only scanned papers if they had at least one photo. And so I uh, I scanned all these papers. If I found a duplication in a paper, I would send the reports to my two co-authors who had to both agree. If they didn't agree, I, I took it out. So we had at least, it wasn't just me seeing these things. Both of my co-authors had to agree that A, it was a duplication and B, it was inappropriate. And so together we sort of developed um, a consensus for, for what we thought uh, should be uh, marked as a duplication. So in that set of 20,000, we found 800 papers with duplicated figures within the paper. I didn't scan specifically for across papers, which is much harder. Um, so 4% of these papers contain duplications. Now, some of these might be honest errors, especially if they were just simple duplications. And we made sort of a, an educated guess that about half of these could have been done intentionally. And I think we were very mild and generous in that, uh, you know, could have been more, but, you know, let's say that about half of these were done intentionally. That would mean that 2% of these papers contained uh, at least visible, intentionally misleading photos. Now, does that mean that that's the percentage of misconduct? Is it 2%? Well, it was, of course, only in biomedical papers. I focused on molecular biology papers that had photos and you know, you cannot really extrapolate that to all other papers. A lot of other papers in other fields might not even have photos. A lot of papers would only maybe have a table and a line graph or so. Um, but alteration in, so fraud, let's say, in other data types is actually much harder to detect. As I said in the beginning, you can just type in some numbers in a spreadsheet and make a nice line graph, and you would never suspect that it was made up data, fabricated data. So it is much harder to detect duplications um, or even manipulations in data that are not photos. And you know, if a person is a good Photoshopper, if you move your sample under the microscope a little bit farther, I would also not be able to detect it. I really only detect the tip of the iceberg, the visible problems. And so the real percentage of misconduct in science papers has to be much higher than 2%. And you know, people have estimated it to between be between five and 10%. And I think that's a more realistic range. And it might be even higher in some fields or some journals that are targeted by fraudsters. Um, looking at the, the correlation between the impact factor of these journals. So I looked at 40 different journals. So you see 40 different points here, data points on this um, graph. And I plotted the impact factor of the journal to um, against the percentage of problematic images. And you see sort of a roughly, it is statistically significant, but you know, it's only 40 papers. So you could argue, you know, maybe it's not enough, but there seems to be a negative correlation between impact factor and percentage of problematic images, meaning that the higher the impact factor, the lower the percent of these visible problems. Uh, you know, again, I'm really only catching the dumb fraudsters, the tip of the iceberg. So maybe, you know, screening in high impact journals such as Science and Nature, which are the, the two data points most, most on, the, on the right of the figure. Maybe uh, these are more experienced fraudsters. We don't really know that, but uh, there's all kinds of factors that could determine this negative correlation. But there are some journals that do, do really well with a low impact factor, but there are some low impact factor journals, um, most notably that dot on the top, you know, that has 12% of problematic images which is a Spondylos journal that really did very poorly. And there were lots of problems in that, uh, in that paper, in that journal. So what you should do if you find such a, an image problem or any problem in a scientific paper is to report it to the journals and or to the institutions. So that's what I did. So back in 2015, 16, when I uh, started writing that paper, I had found around 800 papers and I reported all of these to the journals. Five years later, around 2020, 
I checked how many of these papers had been retracted or corrected. And as you can see on the graph on the, the bottom, um, that big blue chunk of the, the pie chart is all the papers that no action was taken. And that's the majority. So almost 66% of these papers, there was no action taken after five years after reporting this to the journal. And only one third had either had or received a correction, an expression of concern or a retraction. And, and so that was frustrating that, you know, only one third of these papers at best get, get, you know, corrected or retracted. And in some cases, the correction was for what appeared to be image manipulation, which was also frustrated, frustrating, but at least there was a correction. But yeah, that two thirds of these papers were not corrected. That was very disturbing to me. And so I started to post these things on papier because my main goal is not to get papers retracted or to get people fired, it's to warn other people that there might be a problem. And so how, if journals are not really responding, if it takes at least five years, and some of these retractions, um, it depends, it's very variable because it's also a question, how, you know, there's a question, I see how long on average does the process of reporting misconduct and retraction of a paper takes. Uh, in my experience, it is around five, six, seven, eight years it's hard to know. There are some sets that are now, it seems that now journals are a bit faster in retracting, um, but it would still at least take half a year. Um, you know, usually these things take, you know, you of, co of course you want some good and thorough investigation, but uh, expressions of concern are actually a nice way for a journal to mark a paper as, you know, there is a problem, we're going to tell the reader that there's an expression of concern and we're going to you know, do an investigation in the meantime or maybe refer it to the institution to do an investigation and then we'll take a decision. And so I think that's a good tool that's not used a lot yet. As you can see, it's just a tiny sliver, barely visible in my pie chart. But I wanted to have a more immediate way of alerting readers. So I'm using Papier, which is an online journal club, as they call themselves. It's run by volunteers. And if you install their plugin, and you do a literature search uh, on the image on the right on this slide, you can see how your PubPeer, PubMed search might look like if there is a paper that has a PubPeer comment. You'll see these green banners and you can click on it and see what comment has been left by other people. So I feel that's the best way that people like me who scan the papers for all kinds of problems. And there's many people like me doing it. Uh, I do it under my full name, but many people operate under pseudonyms you can see if people have left a comment. And by now I have you know, scanned uh, many papers, maybe even a hundred thousand or so. I found over 7,000 papers with problems on, you know, so far. And um, my work has now resulted in uh, over a thousand corrections and 999 as of today, corrections. So waiting for number a thousand, but over a thousand retractions and almost a thousand corrections. Um, but yeah, still, I feel a lot of papers are not being addressed and are still just, just marked on papier and there's no action. Also, institutions seem to vary widely in how they address these fraud, these allegations of misconduct. There are several articles where there are people, there are professors who have dozens of papers marked on papier with problems. The first authors are all different, but it's always the same lab that pops up. And these people still are employed. There's an article in the New York Times um, talking about one of these cases. This person is still employed, to the best of my knowledge, um, and has actually um, or th yeah, threatened to sue the person who, uh, who was the whistleblower. And uh, you know, there's a long case. He also sued the New York Times for this particular headline and lost that case. And now his lawyers are suing him because he's not paying his lawyer. So there's a lot of drama, a lot of fun stories behind the scenes, but these people are often still employed and they don't seem to really, you know, be receiving any uh, consequences for their for their misconduct. And, you know, this image, what you can see here on the bottom in the middle, that's, uh, you know, what appears to be heavily manipulated image. But the Chinese government declared that there was no misconduct or plagiarism found, uh, even though this person had 63 papers on papier. 
Um, and so, you know, you have to ask yourself, how is this not misconduct and how is this person not responsible for, for what happened in, in their lab? Now, Stanford, of course, recently has been uh, in the news because their president has under received allegations of misconduct. Not while he worked at Stanford. He has also worked at um, Genentech and UCSF. Um, but yeah, his papers are now um, under investigation. Stanford initially wanted to investigate this case by the board of um, the board of trustees, of which the president himself is a member, and that was heavily criticized. So then, under public pressure, they actually had an outside committee investigate um, his papers. And so far, he has now uh, retracted three papers, and he has stepped down as the president. But he's still going to be active as a researcher and. Uh, overseeing a research group. Um, so it's a very complex case, but at least the university under public pressure decided to have this investigated by an outside committee, which I feel when it involves the, the president himself, that seems like a good outcome because yeah, if the university itself would investigate it, the outcome would not likely have been that he was responsible for, for overseeing the research. So very complex cases handled very differently by different universities. There seems to be a lot of conflict of interest in investigating these cases, especially when it involves not just a graduate student, but suspicions of allegations in a lab where there might be a, you know, a bullying or very demanding professor. So um, how do authors respond? So there's a very interesting a bunch of responses on papier. When you post these things, sometimes the author will come back and give a response for how these cases could have possibly happened. So one of the examples I just showed you, uh, shown here at the top, the, the author replied two days ago, these similarities are entirely anticipated and are caused by a non-uniform potent applied current within the material. So some, some people call this on Twitter, somebody called this techno babble, which I th thought was an excellent term. Like they, they try to throw in a lot of explanations for what if could have happened, but you know, this <laughs> molecules don't arrange exactly in the same way every time. And so it, I can only think of this as digital manipulation. I have looked at thousands and thousands of uh, microscopy photos. So, um, but yeah, the authors will try to, have some explanation. And unfortunately, some editors will fall for these nonsense uh, explanations. Uh, another author said for the, the photo shown here in the middle of these duplications uh, within uh, these overlapping images, they said, well, yeah, but all tissues look alike. They all have the same cell architecture. So of course, images look similar. Well, they overlap. So when they're representing different experiments. So I have some serious questions, but again, the author just try to try to minimize the problems. And the, the bottom one was a very funny one where they said that, yeah, the software at that time, the when you took a new photo, it didn't erase the old photo. It just had some parts over it that rearranged themselves in a different way. And it also sounded like very technically. And I think a lot of editors might fall for these explanations, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm just like, how how on earth did these cells organize themselves in exactly the same structure? So yeah, I, I'm very skeptical of these explanations, but they're, they're very funny sometimes to read. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit. Um, I've talked about perhaps Photoshopping and, and individuals who might do these things, but um, it's sort of the elephant in the room is artificial intelligence. And I think this is this has already and will change the way we think about originality of authors and also of you know student written essays. This is this is a big problem because AI can do wonderful things, I'm sure, but it can also create fake uh things that did not happen, fake papers, fake images. So just as some examples, you know, there's there's a lot of AI chatbots that will create fake information because they they will pick things up from the internet and they will tell them as truth. They will create fake references. And if you search, for example, uh, of the text as an AI language model, uh, you will find a bunch of papers that have that text in it. Um, and these are not papers describing ChatGPT. They're 
papers being accepted and published as real scientific papers, but they're written by some chat GPT like chatbox, some generative AI. And they are based on, they're, they're sort of plagiarized text, but because they're unique, they're, they cannot be found by the classic plagiarism detection uh, tools. And, you know, is this allowed or not? And I think this is a complex question as a person for whom AI, for, who, as a person for whom English is not my first language, I would love to use AI to help me write better sentences. And I can see that could be very useful for a lot of people, but you don't want it to write a complete paper and include all kinds of fake things or, or made up references that, that don't exist. So it's a very um, hard to draw a line. What can we accept and what is not acceptable? And, and this is obviously also a problem in, in uh, academics where, you know, do students, can they use these tools or not? Um, is it okay as a scientist to, you know, if we do experiments, maybe you could say, hmm, it's fine for an AI chatbot to write the paper around it. Maybe that's not really part of science. It's about the experiments and the data, but it's hard to draw the line here. And I think this is all so new that we have not really dealt with the ethics of AI. And I'm struggling with this myself because I think there's good applications and there's poor, bad applications. In the hands of the wrong person, this could lead to all kinds of fake, um, fake news stories and fake science papers. And even more worrisome is the ability of generative AI to create fake images. Shown here on the left are three images that do not represent real events. They're, they're made by Dell E or um, uh, some other generative AI image um, uh, program. So it, there's AI tools um, that can create images of people who do not exist. There's tools that can generate, you know, recognizable people wearing perhaps a designer coat, but this is, you know, Pope Francis, but yeah, that, that didn't happen. And also Trump wasn't arrested by uh, a bunch of police officers. These images look very realistic. There's still some things where you can recognize they're, that they're fake, but, you know, that next year these tools will even be better. And so if we can create images that are recognizable of people or that can create faces of people who do not exist, it's probably very easy to make AI generated photos of tissues and, and cells. And so some uh, examples are shown on the right. And this was a paper from uh, almost two years ago. Of course, now these tools are even better and it will probably be impossible to, to distinguish fake from real images. And this is going to be a massive problem and maybe it already has infiltrated scientific papers. It's just impossible to recognize fake from real images anymore. And this can be used in the hands of the wrong person. It can be used to create fake papers. And this brings me to the topic of paper mills. So paper mills are, uh, I guess, how do you call them? Networks of people who do who sell papers that do not exist or that are made up or are plagiarized to authors who need them. So what they sell is basically the paper, or you could argue they sell the authorship. So they will say that you can find these advertisements on Facebook very easily. I found the two shown here on this image, a uh, call for authorship. Like they have a, we have a paper, and if you pay us, you will get your name on this paper. How does this work? Um, it seems that in some cases, these paper mills are um, working together with editors to get them to get these papers published, or they have an accepted paper and they add a couple of extra authors who will pay for it. So they're sort of brokers of papers. But in some cases, these papers are generated by um, by some uh, chat GPT type of um, AI, or they're plagiarized and pseudonymized. And there's all kinds of different scams going around. So there's no, no one uh, scam fits all. They're all different people coming up with the same idea, like, oh, we can actually sell authorships and make money. And it's very hard to recognize these, although in some cases in the earlier uh, years, you can recognize some of these papers. So just as an example, this is a set of papers we recognized. And I was part of a bigger team 
um, that uh, recognized that the, all these papers were were fake. And so this, we call this the tadpole paper mill, and they all had very similar images. So these images of Western blots all had the exact same background, not just within a paper, but across papers as well. So we found a group of papers that about 600 papers that all had that same background. And it seems that the bands, these black stripes on it were generated, you know, by some, some generative adversarial network, GAN technology, or some other more primitive form of AI. And because they made the er error of using all the same background, we could recognize them. And so these 600 papers, we, we flagged them and, and I have to give credit to Morty and Smut Clyde, Jennifer Byrne and uh, Jana Christopher uh, and many others who played a role in finding these papers. Um, I don't wanna pass it off as my own, but uh, yeah, credit is due to a lot of other people working on this problem. So together we found 600 papers and many of these are being retracted um, and very often they have very similar title structures, but they're published in different journals. And so they were deliberately targeted to different journals and they're hard to recognize, um, but many of these papers are being retracted and they're all in the same field of non-coding RNA. Some other papers uh, that, this is a set of papers I found that all appear to have the same source published in mainly in two different journals. Um, and these papers all had impossible coordinates of where plants were. Um, uh, so, so they all said that they were collecting plants in Iran and uh, the plants were all connected, correct, uh, collected at different locations, but the locations were very similar across all these papers. So the ones marked in red boxes all have the same location, even though they represent different plants. And the latitude and longitude also have very weird numbers that don't even exist because you know they're given in minutes and seconds and so if you if you have 93 seconds that seems to be impossible so these coordinates are not even possible but they're all copy pasted um, and used in different papers and this was also part of a citation paper mill so not only were there probably the authorships being sold but also the citations seem to be very heavily favoring uh, two particular authors who might have been the masterminds behind these papers. And so there's all kinds of weird things, problems that you could find once you are open to them. Um, maybe you can spot the problem in this particular table. And so there's um, in this table, um, this is also part of a paper mill. And why do we think that? Because they all had very similar tables and text, but the cancers differed, the non-coding RNA numbers differed. But uh, you can see there's a big problem because this is a paper about prostate cancer and look at the gender distribution. Half of the patients were female, which is very unexpected with prostate cancer. So we believe these are papers that have, the numbers are changed, but in this case, they forgot to take out the, the females. And this is how you can recognize that these papers are often written on a template and some of the things are changed. So it's hard to really find that these papers are all based on the same template. And here's an example of a paper mill that, uh, you know, another group of spammers that, uh, scammers that use what is called tortured phrases. Basically, these are plagiarized papers, but the text is hard to recognize. It's not exactly the same. What they do is they take text written by others and they synonymize all the expressions. So they have some some way of sort of translating. Sometimes it's translating into another language and translating back into English. Sometimes it's synonymizing a lot of the expressions. So in this particular paper, it's about bosom malignancy. And you're like, what is bosom malignancy? Um, and uh, then you, you know, a sentence that you can see here in the abstract is that chest peril is a remarkable kind taking all into account and basic parts of ladies' room worldwide. Well, does, what does that mean? Well, and then if you find the original, it's actually about breast cancer. And it's one of the main reasons for women's deaths globally. And so you can see these synonymized texts are sometimes funny. It doesn't make sense at all. And, but you cannot quite put your finger on it. But um, so Guillaume Cabanac is one of the main people who have discovered these types of paper mill um, writing style. And so these are, uh, there's massive amounts of these papers and he's trying to inventorize that. And there's a whole database of them 
that uh, he wants to add to Papir and hopefully get retracted because these are all you know plagiarized texts. But it's hard to find the original text actually. It's a, it's a lot of puzzling to try to find these. Yeah, bosom peril is breast cancer or chest peril, and it's it's really funny. There's also counterfeit consciousness, which actually is artificial intelligence. And so he has uh, Guillaume Kamenak has a whole database of these. Uh, synonymized, what he called tortured phrases. And once you recognize them, you can use them as a hook to find more of these papers. And then some of these paper mills are actually targeting special issues. So special issues are a sort of a money-making way for a lot of publishers to make extra money. So what they do is they assign a guest editor who can then look at papers uh, and uh, you know, published papers. So usually they will not be very experienced. And in some cases, it appears that the guest editors of these special issues are working together with the paper mills, perhaps receiving a kickback of the income that the paper mills make. They might actually use that to buy in one of the editors, the guest editors. And so there was a massive problem recognized at Hindavi, but also MDPI is a, one of those open access publishers that have a lot of these um, a lot of these um, special issues that appear to have been targeted by paper mill articles. And if you look at Hindavi, so there was this, uh, Hindavi has been bought by Wiley. There was an announcement earlier this year in Retraction Watch that they were going to retract 1,200 more papers. But I just did an inventorization of the number of papers that they retracted. This year alone, Hindavi has retracted almost 5,000 papers and, you know, we're, we're, the year is not over yet. So there's a massive amount of retractions this year from Hindavi special. They're all special issues. Uh, it was believed that a lot of these, um, yeah, special issues were run by guest editors who either did not pay attention to the peer review process or who were in the loop and just receiving kickback from paper mills. And so these are just massively being retracted and uh, yeah, there's there's probably more to follow, but it's a, it's a very big problem. And at least Wiley has recognized that. And, and he, yeah, that some of these, a lot of these Hindavi articles are, are not very useful. And, you know, there might be some real papers in there, but a lot of the, those appear to have been targeted by paper mills. And MDPI, unfortunately, has not really seemed to have recognized this problem, but is um, massively... Uh, inundated with these papers as well. So this brings me to my last slide. Um, I've talked about what my personal belief is, that science is about discovering the truth and that science misconduct is everything that science is not, you know, it's, it's everything that science should not be. Science misconduct is about deliberately changing the outcome of a science experiment. And yeah, that's not what we should call science. There should be more consequences because unfortunately the rewards of fraud are high. Uh, the consequences are low. And so there's a disbalance. If the chance of getting caught is low, you know, imagine we would all be speeding. We would all be crossing red lights because we would never get a ticket. And I feel rules are there to be enforced. Without enforcement, people are going to, yeah, just see the rewards and will do fraud. We focus probably way too much on quantity, while we should focus more in science on reproducibility. Um, also, it takes a village, not just the role of people like me, but reviewers, journals, institutions, funders. We should all care about research uh, integrity. And it seems that there's a growing um, responsibility that is being taken, but uh, a couple of years ago, there seems to be very little, um, re re very little action being taken if allegations about misconduct were raised. So we need faster correction because that is the only thing that can serve the other readers and the other scientists reading these papers. And also we need better legal protection for those who re raise concerns. There has been a very recent case where a researcher uh, at Harvard uh, was being accused of misconduct was even being uh, put on uh, leave and a, two, a couple of her papers were going to be retracted. But she is now suing uh, both her university as well as the people who raised the concerns for a large amount of money, which these researchers do not have. So 
you know, you can be right to raise concerns, but in the US, at least, if you're being sued, you have to pay your an attorney to defend yourself. And that will cost you, you know, perhaps $250,000. And so, you know, most people don't have that type of money. So how do we legally protect people who just raise concerns in an ob objective way? So that's a big problem um, because, you know, legal dis uh, scientific discussions should not be held in the courtroom. And then finally, there's a tremendous cost of misconduct. I mean, people trying to replicate science papers, that's one big problem. But for science as a whole, for, you know, bringing deliberate false narratives into the public eye, I think that's that's a big problem. And we've all seen the consequences of that. And fewer and fewer people seem to believe in science. And unfortunately, you could walk away from my talk thinking that all science is flawed. And I hope you're not. Like, we, you know, there's problems in science, but uh, hopefully we can do better. So with that, thank you. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Oh, thank you so much for this amazing webinar. Always a pleasure to listen to. Uh, I think we have uh, a question uh, in the chat uh, from a colleague. Uh, I found 75 qualitative citation review reports made by nine reviewers, all of them co-authors themselves in about 20 journals, all of them from the same publisher. Would you name it as a reviewer's ring? I'm not sure what coercitive means, but um, if all the reports have similar language, yes, that could be um, a reviewer's ring. I mean, I've seen cases where, course, I don't even know what that means. Okay. I don't even know what that means. Sorry. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I mean, if it's all the same language and very short peer reviews, uh, you know, all have very similar wording. Uh, yes, that could be that could be a very uh, big sign of a peer review ring. Uh, in many cases, we don't really know who the peer reviewers are for, for a journal, but um, journals like um, Frontiers and MDPI actually sometimes name the peer reviewers. And then if you look into who these peer reviewers are, you can see they actually work together often with the papers they, the authors of the paper they have reviewed. And so sometimes you can find them, but very often you don't know who the peer reviewers are. But people have looked at wording of... Um, scientific uh, reviews and found peer review rings with that because yeah you would never use the same language it's similar as fake peer reviews on amazon uh, these things are often being misused and a lot of these special issues also have probably not been peer reviewed very well but it's you know if if you if you find something please post it on papier yes wording is similar and oh review is asking for adding references yes that's a very um doesn't necessarily mean that it's a peer review ring, but at least a reviewer who is very, you know, on the lookout of their own papers. And that should, you can sort of say maybe one paper you can put in, but if they ask you to put in five papers of their themselves, yes, that a, a good editor should, should refuse that and should immediately kick out that peer reviewer. But yeah, there's no consequences for these things. There's people are just too naive, unfortunately. Uh, we yes. have another question. Yeah. What do we do if we find scientific misconduct? Yeah, so the, the real officially you should report it to the journal and you should so that you have to find the journal editor and write them a um an email and, and you know making sure you word your uh, concerns. You can if it's multiple cases of the same person, I would also write to the uh, to the institution or to the funder. But the writing to the journal editor is the main thing that you should do. But as I've shown, unfortunately, in many cases, the journal editors do not seem to be willing to respond. And so I would also put it on papier. You know, be objective, create an account there. You can create an account completely anonymously and you can, uh, but you have to be objective. You cannot say, uh, you know, that professor is a fraud. You can, but you can say this image looks remarkably similar to that image or this peer review is the same. The wording is the same as in those 10 other papers. Or this, uh, you know, you can see that that suddenly 10 papers were added to this to the list of references that have no real connection to the paper itself. And so you can ask yourself why were, you know, why were these in, uh, inserted? So whatever is objective and uh, worded, yeah, objectively, that could end up on papier. 
So the time is almost up uh, and I would uh, really like to thank you. Oh, there is one more. Oh, yeah, that's the same one person. More comment. Yeah, the first step is to write to the corresponding author. They never reply. Then the journals, they also don't reply. What do we do after that? Yeah, I mean, I'm facing the same problem and I'm, you know, hopefully a, um, you know, I've earned hopefully my, my stripes in this field. They very often the journals also don't respond. So now I ask, I usually write, like I'm keeping track of which or with which journals do respond. And I will post about this sort of as a warning, like I'm keeping track of you if you respond to me. So most journals nowadays will say, okay, we'll look into this, but then, you know, you never hear anything. And, you know, even some of the retractions that are featured in Retraction Watch, I've written to the journals and I just hear it through Retraction Watch. They didn't write back to me, even though that is uh, COPE guidelines. But it's, um, yeah, it, it is a problem. Um, and I cannot really tell you what to do other than to post it on papier. I feel that's my civil duty to, to, uh, uh, yeah, to to report it there. Um, uh, so there's also a question about my email. Sure, I'll be happy to. Shall I put it in the chat? Yes, please do. That's and during the time, uh, we have another question. I'm not guaranteeing that I will answer you <laughs> because I get a lot of requests. It's elisebeck at gmail.com. So I put it here in the webinar chat. I hope everybody can see that. Yes. And one more question. If you had some advice to give to journals on how to address AI and the issues it brings to image manipulation, what would it be? It's a tough question because I'm not a computer scientist and I would not really know how we can nowadays distinguish real photos from AI photos. Um, and so we can think about maybe having, you know, all AI tools have a um, an imprint that says this is AI generated, but I'm sure this could be removed. Um, you can also think about the other way, like that all microscopy photos or all scanners have some digital imprint that it's a real, you know, generated by a size microscope on that and that day at that location or something like that. Uh, that could also be tampered with. But um, so I'm not actually quite sure because I think we're at a stage we can no longer distinguish you know footage or photos from uh, that were generated from real ones like you know if you think about Jurassic Park the dinosaurs look pretty realistic now right like <laughs> we know it's fake but <laughs> man that looks yeah. very good yeah so I don't I I'm I'm at a loss actually I'm a bit pessimistic also oh uh, one more question have you faced criticism for your work in reporting this misconduct yes i have faced a lot of criticism i have a loyal team of uh people on twitter who harass me uh, almost daily um i have been threatened with lawsuit by some professors it hasn't come to a real lawsuit yet but the the data colada um uh, lawsuit that i talked about the harvard professor who's suing those three professors criticizing her work that has uh, given everybody pause because it will hinder, it will, uh, it's sort of meant to silence critics. And I, I feel that's not the route we'll go. So I'll keep on doing what I'll do, but I hope people will support me if I ever being, am being sued. Um, uh, so far, the Data Collada team is, uh, you know, the, we organized the fundraiser and we organized, you know, we got $250,000 in 48 hours. So we have that money for to help them defend oh. themselves. But um, it's it's tough. So yeah, I have people calling me a failed scientist and an ugly fat pig uh, like every day and death threats and so. But yeah, it you sort of get used to that. But I do cry because some of these uh, insults are really bad. But yeah. And I'm so sorry to hear that. And I want you to know you have an enormous support guys, I do. and well you. <laughs> as well. And you are a hero to so many of us <laughs> and a role model. So you have to know that as well. I know that. I, yes. Yes. So and we we are all hoping that you are going to keep up with this. I will. I will keep on doing what I do. <laughs> but if I have to cough up $250,000 to defend myself. I do hope there's some, you know, everybody donates a dollar and I'll, I'm almost halfway there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so you sweet. so much. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure having you here. Uh, it was an outstanding talk as always. And uh, keep up with your good, 
good work. We are really grateful that you could be with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sonia, for inviting me and my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. See you next time in a month. Yes. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye.